If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, let's go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter 20 as we continue our walk through this great gospel uh, that's given to us by our Lord in His Word. And as you turn in there, I just want to remind you about a very special event in the life of our church tonight, 6 p.m., our leader rally right here in the sanctuary. We're going to talk a little bit about our vision for the future and kind of unpack how that vision is going to affect each of us as individuals and affect our various ministries and just how we're going to work together to accomplish that. Now, you may hear leader rally and think, well, I'm not a leader at the church. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a pastor. It doesn't apply to me. Actually, if you're a volunteer here, we consider you a leader. Uh, If you are engaged in the ministries of our church, tonight is for you. We want to affirm you. We want to inspire you. We want to thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. If you've been here for any length of time and you've been thinking, I need to get more plugged into my church. I want to know where we're going in the future. Tonight is for you. So we'll meet here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock, and then we're going to have breakout sessions afterwards, and all of our our various ministries are going to meet in different locations on the campus. And so it'll be an opportunity for you if you've ever wondered about serving on our First Impressions team or our safety and security security team or in our children's ministry, be a great way for you to kind of eavesdrop on what they're doing and figure out if that would be a good place for you to get plugged in. So I hope you'll join us there tonight. And we're going to start uh, our time together here by reading a word from the Lord. I want to invite you to begin reading with me. Luke chapter 20, verse 19. The Holy Spirit records, the scribes and chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour. For they perceived that he, that is Jesus, told this parable against them. But they feared the people, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent." May God bless the reading of his word. As we meet this morning, we stand in a line that is 2,000 years long, a line with Christians who walked before us, who worshiped the same Jesus we do, and who struggled to live out the faith that had been handed down to them by the previous generation. And a question that every one of those Christians had to deal with, had to wrestle with on their own was this. During their time on earth, how do they, how do we, how do I reconcile obedience to the earthly authorities that have been placed over me when I believe in a higher authority, namely the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? I mean, sometimes there's no issue, but what do I do when these two authorities come into conflict in my life, come into conflict in my world? What do I do when those two authorities are not in conflict, but I don't like what my government is telling me to do or what's expected of me as a citizen of the country in which I live? Now, the words of Jesus in today's passage actually give us an opportunity to reflect upon this issue as he again makes a statement about his lordship. So by way of context, let me remind you where we were in the previous week. Last week, Jesus was confronted by the religious leaders of the day, and he responded by their, uh, to their verbal sparring by refusing to justify himself. So they came and they were, they were asking him to uh, say, by whose authority are you doing all of these great works? And, they, and it was a trap. Because if he said he did it by the authority of God, they they would have found a way to try to use those words against him. And if he said anything else, it would have undermined his ministry in the presence of the people. And so Jesus asked them a question. They were scared to answer the question, so he didn't respond. And then he told a parable in which he affirmed his identity as the Son of God and the heir of the kingdom. And the religious leaders of the day had no response to his defense, so they sought a more surreptitious approach, and they decided to send spies into the camp. And that's where we pick up in verse 19. 
The Bible says the scribes and chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So Jesus told a parable about a vineyard owner who had leased out the vineyard to some tenants, and he sent one of his servants to go and collect the fruit that was due him as owner of the vineyard. That was the rent that was due. And they didn't want to pay it, and so they beat the servant up and sent him out of the, uh, of the vineyard. And so the owner of the vineyard sent another servant, and they beat him up and kicked him out of the vineyard. And he sent another servant, and they beat him up and kicked him out of the vineyard. And as you read this parable, the, the nation of Israel, the people that would have heard this in the first century, understood that the vineyard represented the people of God. Even in, in the ancient world, as you walked into the temple, there would have been this big, golden, or, ornate grapevine with huge grape clusters that represented uh, the nation of Israel as God's vineyard. The problem was, in the Old Testament, whenever God referred to the nation of Israel as his vineyard, it was a vineyard that failed to produce fruit. But now in this parable, you've got a vineyard that's bearing fruit, and when God comes to, when the, the owner of the vineyard comes to collect on what's due him, they beat up the servants and send them out. And this was a, a reference to all of the Old Testament prophets that God had call, sent to the nation of Israel and called them to submit to the Word of God, to submit to God as their king. The Bible actually calls them servants in the Old Testament, and they beat this, these prophets and sent them out. And finally, the, the owner of the vineyard in the parable sends his beloved son to the vineyard, the picture of Jesus Christ. And the tenants not only beat him, but they murder him, thinking that they're going to get to keep the vineyard for themselves. And the owner of the vineyard says, no, I'm going to take the vineyard away from you. I'm going to give it to someone else. The chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees heard this parable, and they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And they knew that they needed to do something about this. And they tried to confront him publicly, but he was just too quick-witted. He was too sharp. He was too smart for them. And so now they decide to send spies into his camp. But I want you to notice, yet again, we read that the chief priests and the scribes didn't do what they wanted to do because they feared the people. See, there was a, a, a fear that the religious leaders had in the ancient world, and it was driven by a desire to stay in power, not a desire to please God. They didn't think Jesus was, God, was from God or was God, even though he was claiming to be. But they were unwilling to take a stand for God because they weren't really concerned about God. They were concerned about themselves. And so they send spies in, verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor. They're no match for him verbally or intellectually in the public sphere, so now they're going to catch him off guard. Hopefully they can get him to entrap himself, and they're going to let the government do what they couldn't do, verse 21. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. So the spies come in and they attempt to flatter Jesus. And unintentionally are actually speaking the truth because Jesus does teach rightly. He does speak rightly. He does show no partiality. He truly teaches the way of God. They don't even realize what they're saying as they try to set their trap. But then here comes the question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? I basically ask him a yes or no question. Now, the tribute they reference is a reference to a, a hated tax that was paid to a foreign ruler, in this case, Caesar, who had the power of Rome behind him. One scholar noted that it was a bitter burden carried by the Israelites because it would have been added to all their other taxes. And so, uh, if you go back and read the ancient records, if you added up the civic taxes they paid and the religious taxes they paid, once you added the Roman tax to it, they were given up 40% of what they made. And these were folks that were usually working 10, 12, 14-hour days, six days a week, just trying to make enough money to eat dinner that night and maybe have a little left over to have breakfast in the morning. And so they were tired of this tax. 25 years prior to this event, a religious zealot named Judas fiercely opposed this tax and, and created an uprising. 
And his battle cry was, no tribute that puts God's land and people under the rule of foreigners. And so he began speaking against this tax that was paid, this tribute. And a bunch of people rallied behind him, and they sought to to overthrow the government, but Rome was stronger. And Rome stepped on Judas like a bug and squelched that uprising. And so here's the trap. If Jesus opposes the tax, it would be equated with inciting rebellion against Rome, and that warranted execution. And that's ultimately what these scholars, these these Pharisees and scribes and chief priests are trying to do. But if Jesus answered yes to the question, it would negate any kind of messianic claims he was making because everyone accepted Messiah to come in and to run Rome out of town. We're not going to have to worry about Caesar anymore when Messiah gets here because he's going to be our king. Verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said Caesar's. So the spies come in and they ask him this question. He says, hey, have you got a coin on you? Have you got a denarius? Show me a denarius. Now, the denarius they would have had uh, handed him would have had the imprint of the governor on one side and the words Emperor Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus, basically saying he was a son of a divine being. He was a son of a god. And you can see why that would be a problem for uh, those in the ancient, uh, the Israelites in the ancient world to use that coin. And, And that's why you had to have money changers outside the temple, right? You couldn't come and give an offering to God with a coin that had an inscription to a false god on it. And then on the flip side, it says Pontiff Maxim, chief priest. This was a coin that the Romans, uh, the Roman tax would be paid with. This is a coin that everybody had to use to pay their tax. So here they're trying to entrap Jesus, and he asked for this coin. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able, in the presence of the people, to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Based upon these words and teaching elsewhere in Scripture, here's your big idea for the morning. Jesus deserves our total allegiance. Our government is owed a qualified allegiance. Jesus deserves our total allegiance. Its government deserves a qualified allegiance. Now, the, the primary teaching here is pay the tax. Use a Roman coin to pay the Roman tax, but give to God what is God's. We want to unpack that and combine with some other scriptures today. We want to reflect on that and figure out what it means for us to give to Caesar that which is Caesar and to give to God that which is God. So let's start with giving to Caesar that which is Caesar's. In order to give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, I must do three things. Number one, I need to recognize God's authority over the government. Anybody ever watch the Olympics, the opening ceremony of the Olympics when all the different teams march in? Parade of countries and they go in alphabetical order and then each successive country comes up and they tip their flag to the political leader of that country as they walk by. But there's one country that doesn't do that, the United States. We never dip our flag to anyone else. It's a tradition that goes back to 1912, and it actually became part of the flag code in 1940. But this is what it says, this flag doesn't dip to any person or thing. And it's a source of pride for Americans. But there is one person to whom our flag will dip, and that is to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God has authority over all government. He, Jesus Christ, is supreme. I'm proud to be an American. All right? I have no problem with us having an American flag in our sanctuary, but you'll notice it's on the floor. It's not up here because when we gather together, it's the Word of God that is supreme and trumps everything else. 
And so the first thing we do is we recognize God's authority over government. The second thing we do is we need to understand God's design for government. Even though every earthly government finds itself in opposition to God's word at some time, the Bible teaches that government is a tool used by God to do good. Listen, there is no perfect government. Even if you could get a perfect document, and I think the Constitution is pretty close, right? It's still implemented by imperfect fallen people. There are no ch perfect churches, there are no perfect pastors, there are no perfect church members, there are no perfect governments. So every government is going to find itself in conflict with the Word of God at some point, in some way, shape, or form at some time. But the Bible still teaches that government is God's tool, a tool used by God to do good for us. So Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, Let every person be subject to or submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So no one has authority unless God gives it to them. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. And that sword that's referenced there is actually the executioner's sword. Talking about the government's right to implement capital punishment even. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So the idea is we are to respect and honor those that God has placed in authority over us, namely the government. Why? Because it's an implement, a tool used by God to do good. That's why we pay taxes. So what we see here is an outworking or an extension of what Jesus has said in Luke chapter 20, verses 19 through 26. Another passage of Scripture, this is the Apostle Paul in Romans, listen to what Peter says. 1 Peter 2 uh, verses 13 through 15. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, listen. Both of these paragraphs, Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, were written decades after the crucifixion after the church had begun to grow exponentially and government leaders had begun to systematically persecute Christians. In other words, Caesar was a whole lot worse than our president. Caesar was a whole lot worse than any, religious, any political leader any of us had ever had to live under in our lifetimes, with the exception of maybe one person in this room who grew up in pre-World War II Germany. All right? And the expectation here is that Christians will obey the law of the land because in some ways the laws of the land are given by God. And that's why Jesus can say, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. All you have to do is, and we have some recent examples, right? All you have to do is look to the fall of Iraq or to the situation in Libya or to some current situations in Africa to see that the worst regime is usually better than no regime. Anarchy is unsafe for everyone. Laws are needed. They are part of God's plan for human flourishing, so we obey them even if we don't like them. That's why in, in the Old Testament you have codes for how you could build your house. You have a roof, you got to put a fence around it because people would go up on the roof. You put a fence so people don't fall off the roof. Rules for public safety, part of the Old Testament law. A model for how we're to implement law in the modern world. 
And a lot of our laws in the United States of America are based on or or, or take their cue from the kinds of laws that we find in the Old Testament and the kinds of laws that societies have implemented for all of history. Laws are needed. They're part of God's plan for human flourishing, so we obey them even if we don't like them. So, one, I need to recognize God's authority over government. He implements the authority. He has ultimate authority, but they have authority from him. Number two, I have to understand God's design for government. It's good for me to have government. It's good for me to have laws. My life is a whole lot better because it's illegal to murder and steal right? My life is a whole lot better because of of certain housing codes, right? I'm I'm fairly confident my roof is not going to be ripped off and my house is not going to collapse if a 40-mile-an-hour wind comes through my neighborhood, right? I would not have that same confidence if we didn't have the kinds of laws we have in our country. Third, I need to submit to Submit where man's laws do not contradict God's law. Roman, in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, the Bible records Peter and John having an encounter with the religious and political leaders of the day. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter, who gave us 1 Peter 2 and told us to submit, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. In other words, you can tell us not to preach, but Jesus told us to preach, and his authority trumps your authority. Now elsewhere, he's going to say to submit to the authority of the government, but he's given us a clear example of when we defy the government. We defy the government when government's laws contradict the law of God. So government gets a qualified allegiance. We obey God's law first, and where there's contradiction, we only obey God's law. So that's how we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. First and foremost, yeah, we pay taxes. We pay whatever we owe. We don't need to pay extra. Take every deduction you can get, but pay what you owe. But expanded implications are that we obey what's expected of us. That, I believe, is what Jesus is teaching when he says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But then he also says, Render under God that which is God's. Give to God that which belongs to God. And for me to do that, I need to do a few things. Number one, I have to remember God's authority over me. When Jesus died for me on the cross, he died to purchase me from the slave market of sin. And when through the preaching of the gospel, God opens my heart and my mind to repent and believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit invades my heart and breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets me free. Where once I was a slave to sin, I now have the power to say no to sin. But even though free... The Bible still uses the language of slavery only now to describe my relationship with God. When I surrender to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, when I repent and believe the gospel, I willingly become his slave, his bondservant. And that means his authority over me, his authority over you is absolute. I'm going to give to God that which is God's. I need to understand that his authority over me is absolute. Second thing I need to do is I need to understand God's design for the kingdom. You know, the Bible teaches that there's going to be a point in time in the future when Jesus Christ returns to rule and to reign over the world. And he's going to reign coercively as the leader of the earth. And then there's going to be the new heavens and the new earth where it's just his people that populate the universe. And so we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth when sin will be no more, 
We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth when death will be no more. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth where sin doesn't break our relationships and cause dissension and division. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth when God makes everything right and we live in peace. And the church is designed by a God to be a picture of the future. The church actually functions as a beachhead through which the future kingdom invades the present. Think about World War II when we established a beachhead at Normandy. And there for the first time during World War II, the Allies were able to funnel troops onto the continent of Europe and ultimately defeat the evil Axis powers. The cross and the birth of the church is a beachhead through which the future kingdom of God, through which the Spirit of God is invading and transforming the world one person at a time. And as our hearts are transformed, as our minds are transformed, as our worldviews are transformed, we increasingly bring it to bear on the world around us, obeying the implications of the Lord's prayer that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This affects how we vote. This affects how we lead. This affects how we relate to our government. This affects what we expect of our government, and this affects how we should hold our government accountable. We are blessed to live in a land where we get to vote. We are blessed to live in a land where we have freedom of speech, and we can speak to power, and we should use those privileges. We have an opportunity in the United States of America because of our cherished freedoms, which are foundational to our country, to have a greater impact than any Christian had in the ancient world. In order to give to God what is God's, I have to remember his authority over me. I have to submit, I have to understand God's design for the kingdom and I have to submit to God in everything. Render unto God the things that are God's. You can almost see Jesus taking the coin from the spies and saying, whose image is on this? And then saying, them responding, Caesar's. He says, then give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. And you can almost picture Jesus going, When he says, give to God that which is God's, holding up a mirror and saying, what do you see? See, the Bible teaches that every single one of us has been created in the image of God. Rational beings with souls, mind, and intellect, a will, desires, giftedness. Jesus says, give to God that which is God's. You were created in God's image. Give yourself to God. Submit in everything to Jesus. Just this past week, I read the words of Tim Keller, and they just really struck me. He said, most people want Jesus as a consultant rather than a king. Folks, Jesus isn't here to give you good advice like Dr. Phil. He's here as a king to rule your life. To give to God that which is God's, you must surrender to him as king. So what does that mean? Well, for some, it means that today, for the first time in your life, you're going to repent of your sin and believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross and believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, rose from the grave, you're going to bow the knee to him for the first time ever and repenting, ask God to save you from your sin. 
Here's the good news. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how big a mess you've made in your life. You, God will take you exactly as you are. He will receive you and adopt you into his family. Today can be the day of your salvation. And so he calls to you today. He draws you to himself. The gospel is not even to go home and get things figured out first, and then I can come and start following Jesus. No, the gospel is you bow the knee exactly as you are, and Jesus Christ picks you up, cleans you up, and helps you follow him, helps you live a life that brings you glory. Some of us have never done that. Today, the Lord is calling you to surrender your life to him and become a Christian. There are others in the auditorium today. The way you need to respond to this message, the way you need to respond today is to grow in your understanding of the implications of the lordship of Jesus. So it's possible to bow the knee to Jesus and not understand what that means in every area of our lives. I remember when I became a Christian at the age of 17, I, okay, um, I had terrible anger problems, and I was terrible road rage problems. You cut me off in traffic, there was a good chance I was following you home to tell you about it. And then, through the preaching of God's Word, I began to realize God does not want me following people home and trying to pick fights with them. And then as I continued to sit under the preaching of God's Word and study God's Word, I began to realize it's not just the outward sign. I took a step forward when I quit following people home, but I had to quit flashing peace signs, right? Got to stop doing that too. I can't, I can't quit shaking fists and yelling at them. And then I got to where you couldn't tell outwardly that something was going on internally, but my heart was still bitter and anger every time someone cut me off in traffic. And then I began to grow in my understanding of the Lordship of Christ. Jesus is concerned even with the internal. To sin, to get angry in that situation. To want judgment and justice because those things belong to the Lord. I, it was years later when I bowed the knee in that area of my life. Each step was growing in my understanding of the implications of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as bearing for how husbands, how we relate to our wives, how we lead our wives, how we relate to our children, how we lead our children, how we relate to our church, how we serve in our church, how we relate to our places of employment, how we work, and relate to those who sit at the desk next to us, how we relate to our neighbors, and this morning, I, I just want to ask you as we prepare to respond and worship, what area of your heart is feeling a touch from the Holy Spirit this morning? Where's, where's God calling you to repent? Where's God calling you to submit? Where's God calling you to surrender? You might be so overwhelmed right now, you don't even know all the areas where God's calling you to, to repent and change and surrender. Maybe what you just need to do this morning more than anything else, and really all of us need to do this, is just say, yes, Lord. Just place your yes with your heart at the foot of the cross and allow God to have his way with you. Sounds like a dangerous thing to do because you have no idea where God's going to send you, where God's going to lead you, what God's going to do in your life, but ultimately it's the safest thing you can do. Because the Bible teaches that God actually knows what's best for you. God actually wants what's best for you and has the power to bring about what's best for you. And so when you lay your yes on the table, when you bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saying, not my will, but your will. 
And what I want to tell you as your pastor is you will never regret doing that. Because what God wants for you is always what's best for you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to sing a song of response. And as we do, we'll have pastors down front singing with you. And I just want you to do business with the Lord right where you are. Maybe this morning you do need to come forward. You need to talk to someone about what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Or maybe you need to come forward and pray at the stage. God's no more present here than he is right where you're sitting. So you can do business with the Lord right where you are. But if you come forward to pray, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your real family will see you. And they'll begin to pray for you and pray with you. One or two may even come and lay hands on the shoulder. And without knowing what's going on, just ask the Lord to work in your life. One of our rules here at First Baptist is nobody prays by themselves. So if you come forward, know that others will pray with you. But whatever you do this morning, just say yes to what God is calling you.